In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Cogitationis cordis eus in generatione et generationum, ut eruit a morte animas eorum, et alat eus infame. The plans of his heart persist for the generation of generations, to deliver their souls from death and to feed them in famine. The plans of his heart are eternal, and they're plans that are helpful for us. They're plans for our peace, they're plans for our true joy, they're plans for our salvation. And today on this solemnity, this great feast of the Sacred Heart of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we ask our Lord for a special grace, a special light to be able to see into his heart, to see into his heart where we find the love of God, the love that God has for us in Jesus Christ, as St. Paul would say it, and also to see the love of man, the love of this man, God incarnate, Jesus of Nazareth. Lord, you redeem us with love. You, you redeem us with the divine love of God the Son, you redeem us with the love of God the Father, whose children you make us. You redeem us with love itself, the love of God, which is the Holy Spirit. But you also redeem us with human love. We're redeemed on the cross by a human act of love, by a human act of forgiveness, by a human act of self-sacrifice. The sacred heart of Jesus is a human heart that belongs to a divine person. And on the cross, Lord, after your death, you let that spear pierce your side, pierce once again your sacred flesh as the nails pierced your hands and your feet as the thorns and the crown of thorns pierced your head. You let that lance pierce you with one more wound, and it goes through your side and into your heart. And out of your heart, as we read from the Gospel of John, out of your heart flows forth blood and water. All the blood that you had, Lord, was almost all already poured out in the Passion. From the scourging, to the crucifixion, to the blows that you received, all of that blood was already shed, poured out for our salvation, out of love for us. And the last bit of that blood, and therefore water also comes out, is shed after your death, when they pierce your sacred heart. Lord, what a great way, what a tremendously striking, violent, yes, but striking and complete way of showing how much you love us. To let your heart be pierced, that heart with which you loved your mother, that heart with which you loved God the Father, that heart with which you loved all of your apostles and disciples, the heart with which you forgave your enemies while on the cross. You let it be wounded, wounded for us, to show us that you didn't hold any anything back. There was no love left in the tank our Lord didn't keep any love or any forgiveness or any mercy back from us on the cross. He gave it all, and that giving it all is manifested, is made visible by his heart being, being pierced and by that blood and water flowing forth from his heart. What a tremendous image, Lord, of charity. And it's the charity that you call us to. The night before he suffered, our Lord gave the apostles and gave us that new commandment, the new commandment I give to you, that you love one another 
as I have loved you, that we love one another as he has loved us. Lord, you want us to love each other with this attempt, at least, (laughs) this ideal, at least, of generosity, of totality, of compassion, of forgiveness, overlooking the defects of others, of a great desire to help and, and to serve. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And right from the beginning of the church, in the apostles' preaching, we see it in the letters of St. Paul, this took a, a very central and fundamental place in the priority of Christian life. Charity. Imitating specifically the charity of Christ, the love of Christ on the cross. One of the most famous examples of this kind of encouragement in the early church we find in St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's a famous passage. Paul writes to them, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfishness, ambition, or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. It's a beautiful plea, isn't it? St. Paul's basically begging those first Christians to live charity, to look out not just for themselves, but for the others to overcome their differences and to humble themselves so that they can see the needs and the good qualities of the others more clearly because pride, of course, blinds us to the needs and the the goodness of other people. We exaggerate our own goodness. And he's basically saying, look, if you get this at all, if you you understand Jesus even a little bit of what Christ has done for you, of what the heart of Jesus is like for you. If you appreciate just a little bit <laughs> my preaching and, and what I've done for you and what the Holy Spirit is, who the Holy Spirit is and what he's doing, if you get it at all, then do this. Make my joy complete. Be of the same spirit, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. It's it's like when we say, for the love of God, for the love of God, please do this. For For the highest motive, if you appreciate at all what God has done for you, well then, this is this should be your response. Love one another, love one another, as I have loved you, as our Lord puts it. And then St. Paul explicitly says, this is an imitation, this attitude of humility, enabling and leading to charity, is precisely an imitation of Christ's mind, of, of his spirit, right? of his thoughts, we could say, of his heart. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Have Christ's way of looking at at things, Christ's way of deciding things, Christ's way of feeling about things. Have his heart and mind. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Lord, when we contemplate today this great image, this great reality, and now this great feast in the church of your sacred heart and the love that it shows for us, let it inspire us to once again commit ourselves to Christian charity, commit ourselves to truly being souls of service, souls of forgiveness, souls of compassion and understanding. 
Help us, Lord, to hear this beautiful plea of St. Paul, this beautiful plea of yours at the Last Supper, this plea of all the saints. St. Josemaria, the founder of Opus Dei, encouraged this same attitude among the members of Opus Dei, his spiritual children. And it's something that we can apply to, to everyone, all Christians. This is St. Josemaria. How very insistent the Apostle St. John was in preaching the Mandatum Novum, the new commandment that we should love one another. I would fall on my knees without putting on any act, but this is what my heart dictates and ask you for the love of God to love one another, to help one another, to lend one another a hand, to know how to forgive one another. And so reject all pride, be compassionate, show charity, help each other with prayer and sincere friendship. Kind of like St. Paul. St. Josemaria begs his spiritual children, begs Christians to live charity, to live that new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. But it takes takes conversion, it takes humility. And so reject all pride, be compassionate, show charity, help each other with prayer and sincere friendship. Charity, understanding, compassion. These are really supposed to be the calling cards of Christians. This is what is supposed to set us apart from everyone else who hasn't met Christ, who hasn't met the love of God in Jesus Christ. How we love each other. Jesus, you say this yourself, that by this men will know that we are your disciples, by the, by the love that we have for one another. People will know that I'm a Christian by the way I love other Christians and also by obviously, by the way, I love them. And the world needs this from us. And this is hard, Lord. And our, <laughs> and our Lord makes it a condition for loving him. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And this is my commandment, that you love one another. Lord, I find that difficult. In a way, it's easy to love you directly, Lord, or at least to think that I love you directly. Because you're so good, because you're sinless, because you've forgiven me, because you've done so much for me, you've created me in love, and you died for me on the cross. So I find it easy to love God. Easy to love you, Jesus, directly. But to love that person who I live with, that I find difficult, or to love that co-worker who's always in a bad mood and who doesn't seem to, to appreciate me, Or to love that person who has hurt me in some way by forgiving them, by giving them a second chance or perhaps a third, a third chance. Well, that's hard, Lord. And yet you've made it a condition. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And this is my commandment, that you love one another. Lord, help me not to be a fake Christian. To think, well, I love, I love to pray. I can spend all day in the church. I can spend a week on a retreat, no problem. I can read spiritual books for hours. I love God. I love the faith. I love spiritual things. And yet, perhaps, Lord, we fall into that reprimand of St. John. He who says he loves God, but hates his brother, is a liar. And perhaps, Lord, we don't Really take to heart your words. If you love me, you will keep my commands. And this is my commandment, that you love one another. I remember I was living in Chicago, and I went to a kind of a Christmas gathering for families. And there was a meditation followed by benediction that I gave. I preached the meditation and then gave benediction. And afterwards, it was a kind of reception. I was uh, meeting different families. And there was a young lady there that I knew who had been coming around the center that I was taking care of. And she was there with her family. And she had a number of sisters, of younger sisters. And so she was introducing them to me one by one. And she said, well, Father John, this is so-and-so. And this is so-and-so. And I said, hello, nice to meet you. And so on down the line. And she got to her youngest sister, who was this little girl. She's about 12 years old. 
and she has um, Down syndrome. And so she said, Father John, this is my youngest sister. I can't remember her name. <laughs> this is my youngest sister. And, and I said to her, oh, hi, so nice to meet you. And this little girl looked me right in the eye. And she said, listen, you're not the real Jesus. And I was kind of, <laughs> obviously I was kind of uh, uh, stunned, taken aback by this uh, accusation. Listen, you're not the real Jesus. And the sisters got all nervous. They were kind of embarrassed by, <laughs> by this uh, declaration. And so I made a mistake. I, I tried to explain to her um, some sacramental theology, a huge mistake, um, trying to justify myself. I said, yeah, I know. I, I know I'm not the real Jesus. But, you know, during the Mass, especially in the words of consecration, when the priest says, this is my body and this is my blood. Um, well, in that moment, I actually act in persona Christi. So you could say I am the real Jesus in that moment. And she looked straight at me again, and she was having none of it. And she repeated, listen, you're not the real Jesus. And so uh, I said, okay, I know. Uh, just pray for me, okay? Will you pray for me? And the sisters were all apologetic. Oh, yes, uh, Father John, don't worry. She'll pray for you, and you'll pray for Father John, right? And she didn't really even agree to that. Needless to say, it was a little, <laughs> it was a little bit of an unnerving um, incident. I think it's helpful, though, right, uh, to to realize and to admit, the Lord, you know, I'm I'm fake, I'm a phony. Right? I haven't really let your love for me transform me into you, Lord. I'm not the real Jesus. I, I don't love those who don't love me. I don't forgive easily. I find it difficult, Lord, to love people that I don't particularly like or get along with and all these things lord are ways that that you love that you love me that you love those people in my life and you've called me lord and you've given me the grace to love others as you have loved me lord on this feast of your sacred heart give all of us the grace to be you to be the real jesus lord your open heart on the cross is open for everyone. Your heart on the cross bleeds for everyone. Your heart in the Eucharist beats with love for everyone, the whole world. Lord, make my heart more open, more universal, more understanding, like your heart. The human heart, St. Josemaria writes, the human heart is endowed with an enormous coefficient of expansion. When it loves, it opens out in a crescendo of affection that overcomes all barriers. Lord, expand it. Expand my heart. Give me a, a heart extension. Help me to add a huge addition to my heart so that it can house more people and, and connect to your heart so that it can, it can really house the whole world. Everyone who you, lo you love, Lord, I want to love. Everyone who you forgive, Lord, I want to forgive. But again, Lord, I find this so difficult. To love those who love me, fine, great. To like those who like me, excellent. But to love those who don't love me, don't like me, well, Lord, I need your help. I want to do that, but I need, I need more grace. And teach me how to do it. Uh, teach me how to at least pray for those people that I don't understand or pray for those people who have hurt me in some way. To be patient and kind with those who I might find annoying or or who try my, try my patience in one way or another. There's a saying in Italian that St. Josemaria really liked. It's persevere, servire. In order to serve, serve. In English, it sounds kind of, um, kind of redundant or silly. But in Italian, the word servire means to serve in the sense of helping someone. It also means to be useful. 
And so to say something is not useful is to say it doesn't serve, right? Non, non serve. In order to serve, serve, right? In order to serve, be of service, be useful. On the East Coast, we might say something like, shut up and serve already, right? <laughs> Stop talking and, and, and uh, get to work. But I think it's helpful, right, that sometimes we're too theoretical. How do I love this person? How do I change my heart? How do I have more affection or understanding? Well, in order to love them, serve. In order to serve, be useful, right? Find out how you can help people. What do the people in my life need? And how can I help them with that? What do the people in my life not understand that they need to. And how can I teach them that, either with my words or at least with my with my example? Are there people out there, Lord, that I can help in some way that I don't, just because my lifestyle is a little bit too relaxed or a little bit too self-centered, a little bit too materialistic? Lord, open your heart to me. Help me to see into your heart how you think about my life, the context I have, and how you think I might be able to to love them for you. To love them, Lord, in your stead. Love one another as I have loved you. Our Lord says this in the night before he's about to die, a few months before he's about to leave the apostles forever. It's kind of like the last will and testament of our Lord. Right? Gathering his apostles to himself, and knowing his words will echo through all the ages, like the last thing he says before he goes away leaves us without his human presence on earth. He says, take care of one another. It's kind of like if someone's parent is dying. Right? Imagine a mother or father of a family on their deathbed. And they have a number of children. And they gather them around the deathbed and their message is, take care of each other, love each other. Why? Because I'm leaving, right? I, I won't be here to to take care of you. I won't be here to comfort you. I won't be here to give you this fatherly and this motherly love. And so don't let each other miss that, right? Don't Don't let each other miss this kind of love that I have for you. I actually know someone who this happened to. The, on her deathbed, his mother had him and his sister in her presence. And she said, come closer, come here. And she just told him, he said, take care of each other. And make sure you take care of each other. I'm, I'm going home. This is exactly what she said. She said, I'm going home. Make sure you take care of each other. And this is a little bit, a little bit, I think it's a lot of the sentiment of Jesus. Like, I won't be here to, to look after you in the same way. I won't be here with my, the full expression of my humanity to look out for you, to help you. And so you have to love each other for me as if I wasn't gone, as if I were still here. And then our Lord says in the same context, right? By this, people will know that you're my disciples by the love that you have for one another. So Lord, it's very clear that you want us to have your heart for each other. And our Lord's heart was expressed in a love that expressed itself in deeds, in acts of service. I am among you, our Lord says, as one who serves. Our Lord's heart is the heart of a servant, of someone who wants to help and who expresses that desire to help with concrete actions, with concrete deeds. Lord, help me. Help me to have a bigger heart, more of your heart, a heart that sees the needs of others and corresponds to them, a heart that tries to overcome its own selfish or biased subjective inclinations, our impressions of others many times or how their personality conflicts with ours keeps us from loving them and, and it shouldn't. We need to fight against that. The Feast of um, the Sacred Heart traditionally ends the octave of the Feast of Corpus Christi. In some places in the world, this is still the case where Corpus Christi is celebrated on Thursday. 
but in many other parts of the world, as in the United States, where I am, Corpus Christi celebrated on Sunday, so no, so the Feast of the Sacred Heart no longer ends the Feast of, or the octave of, of Corpus Christi. But there's a beautiful connection there, that in the Eucharist, our Lord's Sacred Heart is beating. It's beating out of love for us. From the tabernacle, they're coming streams of love for us that are that are in sync with the beating of our Lord's Sacred Heart. I know a priest who likes to say that on a retreat or in a time of prayer, it's good just to sunbathe in front of the tabernacle. Just to be there and soak in the rays of God's love that are coming forth from the tabernacle, from the Eucharist. And those rays of love in that beautiful image of the Sacred Heart and the image of the Divine Mercy as well, those rays of love stream from Christ's heart. The divine rays of charity flow through the human love of Christ, that human love of Christ, which come from his heart, right? come from that faculty of love, which is the heart of Christ. I had an app once. It was a, a heart rate app on my phone. And there were two ways to get it to um, measure your heart rate. One was to hold your finger over the um, over the flashlight of the phone, and it would measure it through your skin into your finger, which is kind of fascinating in itself. The other one was really neat. It was like a selfie, and so you would you would put your face. You would look at the camera on the front of your phone. And you'd, you'd line up your face with this oval, which is in the phone screen. And then you would hold it there. And the, the camera would pick up your heart rate from your face. So these geniuses at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, figured out that every time your heart beats, it actually causes your face to imperceptibly light up a little bit such that every time your heart beats, your face actually lights up. Now, to the human eye, this is imperceptible, but to the iPhone, it's not. And so they created an app which tracks your heartbeat by those very small charges of light that come to your face from your heart. Isn't that amazing <laughs> that your heart actually lights up your face. I showed this to a uh, an elderly priest that I was living with at the time. He was in his 90s. And I said, hey, Father Dick, you know, watch this. Put your face here in the phone. And he did it. And then it started showing his heartbeat. And he's like, what the heck? <laughs> what the heck is that? How do they do that? I said, I don't know. I don't know how they do it either, but it's kind of, it's kind of neat. But I've always thought that was, that's kind of a neat um, image for the sacred heart and for our own love, right? That um, what our heart is doing has to be shown through our face. How do I look at people? Am I habitually smiling? Am I happy to see people? Am I concerned? Am I interested? And my love shows through my eyes, shows through my face. Our Lord's love shows through his holy face. Our Lady's maternal love and care for us shows through her face. It's initiated in her Immaculate Heart. Tomorrow, we will celebrate the memorial of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, one day after the Sacred Heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can go to her, Our Lady, Our Mother, pray for us, help our hearts, like yours, to mirror more perfectly this great and wonderful, loving, sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.